You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. and by viewers like you. Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. The often outrageous and hilarious humor of one of America's most creative comedians, Judy Gold, appearing in her smart, funny, and touching one-woman performance in The Judy Show, My Life as a Sitcom, now in an extended run through October 22nd at Manhattan's DR2 Theater at Union Square on East 15th Street, in which Judy pokes fun at herself and her life as a far too tall high school student to the challenges of being gay and in love and having two children with her partner, to her mother's sarcasm and criticism and Judy's own insecurities and, as the title of her hit show suggests, her desire to have a TV sitcom of her own, just like the family sitcoms she watched as a child and which helped shape her view of the world. I'm Mark Gollum, and if you haven't experienced the whirlwind of comedy that is Judy Gold, you're missing something very special. For Judy Gold is a real treasure and an amazing talent. She's a two-time Emmy Award-winning comedy writer and producer of The Rosie O'Donnell Show. Judy was nominated for a 2006 Drama Desk Award for her first one-woman show, 25 Questions for a Jewish Mother, for which she did win a GLAAD Award for Outstanding New York Theater. She's a virtual fixture on American television, has appeared on every major comedy and late-night show in America. She's one of this country's leading stand-up comics, and she has a wonderful CD out entitled, Judith's Roommate Had a Baby. And Judy Gold has also received rave reviews for her serious, dramatic roles as well. Judy's an advocate of gay rights, who speaks honestly and openly about herself and issues confronting the gay community. And in contrast to many Jews in the world of entertainment, she has a strong sense of Jewish identity and is vocal about her love of Judaism and of her commitment to the Jewish people. And recently, after my seeing and loving the Judy Gold show, My Life as a Sitcom, I had the chance to sit with Judy Gold on the set of her one-woman show to talk about her life, her work, and her feelings about being Jewish. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Judy Gold. First of all, I saw 25 questions, mm -hmm. and I come here I thought this was brilliant. The show is bright funny, and it's also very touching and poignant at moments. And I want you to know you did a fabulous job. You and Kate, is it? Kate Moira Ryan, yeah. Who wrote it with you. Um, you did a fabulous job. You know, many people went out and saw Billy Crystal's 7,000 Sundays. Right. And in some ways, this show is of that stature. And I was wondering, by the way, any possibility at all of bringing this to Broadway? Please, from your mouth, and you have a, a <laughs> different route up there, I mm -hmm. heard. Um, a shorter one. Uh, yeah, I would love that. Wouldn't you love that? I would love that. I don't, you know, it, that would be, like, phenomenal. Well, I want you to know, I believe it belongs on Broadway. Thank you. And that's how good it was. Thank and you. And it was sweet and funny, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, if I knew you in high school, oh, please. if I had known you in high school, right. what would you have been like? You know, I was such an outcast. Were you? I was six feet at 13, mm -hmm. 
My parents were much older than most kids' parents. Um, I was very into music and not, I mean, everyone thought I'd play basketball, but I was incessantly teased. I mean, I could not walk into a classroom late. I could not, I mean, in front of my house, I would be walking home on the street. They would stop in the car and yell, you know, yell Bigfoot and Sasquatch. And, and it was, my mother used to always say, Judith, they're jealous of you. And I'm like, yeah, Ma, they're really, and I would, you know, I'm in a band uniform, the pants are too short, you know, I'm playing the clarinet, they're not jealous of me. But there was a part of me that knew that I was gonna get through it mm -hmm. and that I was better than them. Mm -hmm. And so, it, I don't know, it carried me through. Where was this, Judy? I was in the beautiful, wonderful, incredible, Clark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I mean, just a wonderful place. And you know, it's so funny because my parents, my mother was very religious. And so, you know, kosher home. And the whole, the whole, our whole family revolved around the synagogue. I mean, that was it. You know, every social event was about the synagogue or B'nai B'rith or Hadassah, you know, with them. And so you'd think there was a clique of Jewish girls that were my age, and they were so mean. And it's funny because, you know, I still remember mm -hmm. them. And so I did the show in Williamstown. And one of the click, we used to call them the click. There was a bunch of kids, you know, my age who were, you know, in Hebrew school with them and stuff that um, were also little outcasty and we all hung out. And one was fat, you know, one had asthma, you know, it was all, you know, and I was the tall one. And so I do the show in Williamstown and, the, and, uh, this girl's waiting for me, you know, this woman's waiting for me afterwards, and, said, and she says, hi, I went to high school with you, and I'm like, uh, and when I know it's one of them, I act like I don't remember them at all. So I'm like, oh, right, yeah. And she asked me if I was mean to, if she was mean to me, which was like, wow. And I said, you, you weren't mean. You never did anything vicious, but you were, were dismissive and didn't do, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Which is probably just as bad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and then we went through some people. She was like, I said, oh, she was a jerk. She was awful to me. And it was, it's sort of like cleansing. Mm -hmm. But they don't remember. They don't know. It has no, they have no idea. You talk about this a lot in your show. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, you know, every show is a combination of both fact and fiction. Mm -hmm. And I once, a long, long time ago, had the honor of interviewing Isaac Pasheva, a singer. And I asked mm -hmm. him, to what extent are your novels, autobiographical, and he said they're all a combination of fact and fancy. Right. And if you bring them together well enough, you have a good book. Right. So I'm asking you, to what extent am I watching? Fancy? Yeah, as opposed to fact. Uh, it's pretty much all fact, except, uh, as I mentioned in the show, that I lived in a studio apartment with my ex, and we had two cats named Martina and Billie Jean. The cats were not named Martina and Billie Jean. I see, that's the they fancy. They were named Mr. Shoes <laughs> and Simo. Mm -hmm. It's that a good line, That would be the though. fancy. It's I know, a good but you, line. How can I get right. rid it's of that line? Good, it's a good line. It's so line. funny because one of my friends says to me, oh, that wasn't, I, I mean, that's funny, but that wasn't really the name of the, I'm like, no one else cares <laughs> right. but you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, but it's a lot of fact, based on fact. It's all based on fact. It, it's pretty much all true. And the way I write with Kate, you know, because she's a, sort of a dramaturg and, so she sort of, she shapes it, and then we, we tell the story. We tell, uh, I tell her the story, and then we figure out how we're going to incorporate it. But they're all pretty much, I would say they're all true. Okay. Yeah. You're an older person now with children of your own. Older? You are older. It's not an insult. This interview's over. <laughs> I could do one of those things. This interview's over and throw the thing. Yeah. When you now look at young people. Right. And you understand how painful high school can be for kids. Right. You understand it in some way better than most. Right. As you look back now on your high school and the pain of it, what did it do good for you? And how much of your creativity and your talent and your content is in some way a product of the pain? You know, I think the bullying and all of that has really shaped who I am in a lot of ways. Um, I, 
you know, I vol I do, you know, I don't have a lot of hard cash. So, and I, I do believe in the, in the Jewish tradition, I don't, I don't know if you'd call it a tradition, I would call it a law of giving back, mm -hmm. of tikkun olam, of sadaka. And the way I do that is through volunteering, doing shows for, you know, these charities. And a lot of them have to do with these kids. I do a lot of stuff with the Hetrick Martin Institute, which is the Harvey Milk School. You have these kids who are mm -hmm. gay, bisexual, transgender. I mean, and when I say they're bullied, I mean, these kids are living on the street. The parents don't even want them. And this is the, uh, they can't go to a regular school because, you know, they are, that's how awful they're treated. So I believe that it has made me a better person. I definitely think I'm much more understanding. I do believe that I also have instilled in my kids, don't you ever pick on anyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, don't you ever call anyone, you know, fat or gay or, and they really, I think they get that. And when they tell me, you know, this one beat up this one. And I said, did you say anything? Did you help that person? You know, I think, and they know, they know that I was picked on and stuff. So, but I think it's definitely, you know, it's funny after I, after I graduated college and I moved to New York City, and I don't think I've ever told anyone this, but I used to walk down the street, and for years, I would walk down the street, and I'd hear laughter, and I automatically thought, oh, no, they're la And I wouldn't even walk by schoolyards. I was like, oh, God. I mean, and I'm in my, tw my 20s. I'm an adult, and I wouldn't walk by mm -hmm. a schoolyard. And then my kids went to school, and I have to tell you, it was kind of, oh, God. And it, you know, I, I mean, it wasn't the way, you know, I'm sure that the kids are like, your mom's really tall. But they kind of think I'm cool. But uh, it really definitely affected me psychologically on mm -hmm. so many levels. But my mother telling me, don't let them see you upset. Don't ever, you know, let them win. But in my head, while they would pick on me, I would think, oh, God, I could get them with this. You know, I always had these zingers. So when I started doing stand-up comedy, nothing would throw me. It was like, you're never going to hurt me. Mm -hmm. You don't even know what I've been, you know, I have a line for, you know, you think you're getting me, please, you know. And, you know, it, it definitely made me a stronger person, but more sensitive in a lot of ways. Is comedy in any way a defense for you? Uh, please, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, my family never, we only... Um, communicated through humor and sarcasm. And my current partner, who is from the most loving, you know, her mother, how are you? Oh, I hope you have a wonderful time. Oh, that sounds like the most incredible dinner. I'm like, what? You know, it's just complete opposite of, how are you, ma? How am I? <laughs> how could I be? <laughs> uh, what are you doing? What am I doing? Same thing I do every day, you know, it's, and, and it was, it's just so funny to just see the dichotomy and the thing in my family that really got you points was one-upping one, mm -hmm. you know, getting a joke in. Um, and it's funny, because I do, I do a joke uh, sh in the show when I say my mother's motto is I came, I saw, I criticized. My sister said it at a dinner table, you know? <laughs> um, I used to do a joke about my mother uh, should be <laughs> My, my mother should be on the geriatric, you know, they should have a d dating game, a geriatric dating game, and my mother should be on, and we did this whole, my sister and I were in the kitchen. I'm getting an MRI, uh, bachelor number one, I'm getting an MRI. Uh, they, they drill a hole into the apparatus so that you could whisper something to me in your sexiest voice. What do you say? I mean, like, this is all stuff mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that we, you know, around, you know, we would just say to each other. and and. It became, it's a sickness to a, lot of, to a large extent. You tell the story in the show mm -hmm. of the time when you're encouraged to go on stage and be a comic and sort of do funny lines about the various people in your group. Right, in my, on my dorm, yeah. Okay. On my floor. But is that when you find out for the first time that you have a gift for making people laugh and for humor? Well, I was always funny, and people say, oh, she's, when, once they got to know me, oh, she's so funny. And I was in the band, marching band, and I was, you know, for that group was probably popular, you know, in, the, in that little small group, because I was really funny. Um, to those people, the other people wouldn't talk to me. But uh, the day that I will never forget, standing there on the floor, on my dorm floor, I had this microphone, I spent the whole day writing jokes, 
and I got a laugh, and I have to say, in my life, never mm -hmm. felt like that about anything. I said, oh my God, thank you. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it's like chasing the high. You know, it's like when people say they do coke and then they have to chase that first. It, that's been my whole life, is, is getting that feeling. Okay, and you do know, and I don't mean to embarrass you, but you're good at it. And that, it, it, that also makes it more fun, doesn't it? It does. I mean, I, I have to say, I feel like I've had integrity. I've never kind of sold out. Uh-huh. I've never, whenever I get this, I get these gut feelings where I'm like, this is not right, or this doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, I'll make a lot of money doing this, but uh, it doesn't, you know, and of course, I have no money, but I've never kind of sold myself mm -hmm. short or done something that's made me really uncomfortable. Okay. And I can't, like, I can't go on stage and be hacky, and I just can't do it. It would just make me feel awful. Are you comfortable telling our audience what your tweet Handle is? Yeah. Go ahead. Judy Gold. J E W D Y G O L D. J E W. Yes. I sign all my emails J E W D Y. You've already mentioned it, but I want you to explain it more. How does this Jewish dimension of your life become not only so important to you, but you're so comfortable expressing it in general? And Judy, I have met with, and I was fortunate enough to produce Broadway and off-Broadway shows. I've been with Jewish performers my whole life. Very many of them don't want any. Many? Uh, most of them. Right. I'd say 95% no, of them. They want nothing to do right. with the Jewish identity. And now I come to you. You're a star. And yet at the same time, you are comfortable with the Jewish identity. I want you to talk to me about that. Well... Uh, when I started doing stand-up, and I talked a lot about, but you know, when you're young, I mean, stand-up comedy is really based on your life experiences. Mm -hmm. So they're limited when you're 22 and you're in a club or you're 20 in a club. You've had 20 years of life. I mean, what are you going to talk about? And being Jewish is a huge part of who I am. And I would get these people in show business, all Jewish, don't talk about being Jewish. Oh. You're too Jewish. Straighten your hair. You're Jew. You're a Jew. And I was like, okay. And and for years, I'd be like, okay. And every time I would do a Jewish joke, like on an audition, like they'd be, they'd have some TV executive in the audience, and I, I was in my back of my head. Don't say you're Jewish. Don't say. I mean, like they didn't know I was Jewish. And finally, I don't know if it was I had kids. I don't know what it was. I was like, don't tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. That's who I am. And when I, when I just, it, t that's me. Well, these other people get on stage and talk about who they are. Why? I'm a Jewish woman. I have a Jewish mother. And I have to say, 25 questions for a Jewish mother. You would think only Jews would come to that show. I can't tell you how many mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. I'm a Southern Baptist. Your mother's exactly like mine. I'm Irish Catholic. I'm German, whatever. You know, it was, it's about family, you know. But I'm not ashamed of being Jewish. I'm proud of it. I do think that there's comedies you know it's so prevalent in judaism i think because well i mean there's many reasons you have the pers persecution if, if you don't laugh about it there's no other you know choice but there's also when you think about how jewish scholars think they take the talmud which is how old thousands that and go right now go to brooklyn someone's trying to reinterpret it mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and very exciting isn't it and they're usually very attractive as well. But I have to say, they're, they take this one text mm -hmm. and try to look at it from every which way. And that's what comedy is. Mm -hmm. It's taking something and looking at it from a direction where people, oh my god, I never even, you know, it's a surprise. A joke is a surprise. You don't see it coming. And... You know, I, you know, my mother's a lot like that. I, you know, I call her up. I think I'm going to have a normal conversation, and it never happens. And, you know, I do think that's, that is the way we think. And you know what? I am proud. You know, that's who I am. Why should I live my life trying to hide who I am? And, you know, my mother, I talk about it in the show, but it was like, you know, Paul Newman, half Jew. I mean, it was like every person that came on the, this one. I remember one of the Cosby kids. They found out one of the grandparents. I knew it. <laughs> I looked at her and I knew that she had some, you know, but it was, they're proud. Mm -hmm. um, my, wait, can I just tell one more absolutely. story? Absolutely. My mother was born in 1922 and no girls went to Hebrew school and no girls got bat mitzvah. 
And every day after school, she would run to the synagogue that was two blocks away from her house, and she would sit in the boys' Hebrew school class every day, voluntarily. <laughs> and when they became bar mitzvah, um, or you know, a bar mitzvah, uh, they did a little thing for her on Shavuos, because her name's Ruth. And uh, she went up to the beamer, did something. And of course, she thinks it's the first bar mitzvah. But, it but when you think about a woman who is, instead of playing with her friends mm -hmm. after school, going to learn about Judaism and sitting with 32 boys. Remarkable. I mean, how can you not love that? Mm -hmm. As you're growing up, mm -hmm. what about your home, Did you, the Jewishness of your home, did you love the most? Um, I think I loved Friday night dinners. Was Shabbat nice? It was, nothing was nice. I mean, we would fight all the time, <laughs> but I expected it. It was something you expected. I was having challah, I was having chicken, I was having wine, we were going to have a fight. I mean, it was... And, what, did, what did you fight about? Oh, God, I spilled the, the um, salt. I looked at this one cross-eyed, you know. Was this just your mother or your father, oh, too? Oh, the whole, the, they were all, oh, you know, you had three grains of rice more than I had, you know. It was just ridiculous. You know, we would always, there was always some uh, thing going on. And you still it, loved it, though? I did. I loved, I loved knowing what, you know, having that sort of, you know, I, when I was in my 20s, like, all right, so I got to college, and I was like, that cheeseburger looks really good. Like, they had, um, in the cafeteria, they had this, like, melted cheese that you could put on everything. And I was like, my mother's not here. <laughs> and, uh, and the cheese fries. Oh. Anyway, so, you know, for a little while. And then... Uh, Your home was kosher. Yes. Oh, God. I mean, you used the wrong knife. House plants. They were in the house plants, because my mother didn't want to go outside. I'm like, Ma, there's a knife in the fern. Uh, Judith! Um, That's how she buried. <laughs> she buried it if it was freezing out. If it was warm, they would go in the garden, and, you know, my father would be digging up, and it's like, you know, spatula comes out. And so, uh, you know, so I didn't, I wasn't, I was sort of like so culturally identified as a Jew, and I would do, like, I would always keep Passover, and I was always like the Jew police with the other... <laughs> You're not going home for Rosh Hashanah. I was like, it was like so ridiculous. And I'm like that with the comics, too. I'm like, you're working on Rosh Hashanah. I mean, really. So uh, it, what really brought it home was I was on the road. My father had passed away. And I had, I had made this decision that no matter where I was, I was going to go to synagogue on Saturday morning and say, Mourner Scottish. And I would go to these places, and I would find these synagogues. I'd look them up before. I'd bring a skirt. I'd get in. Sometimes I took a cab, sometimes I walked, you know. And I remember, because the road is just an awful place, but I remember, like, I'd go to these synagogues, and of course, you know, they would be like, who's that, you know. But they're singing the same songs. Uh -huh. They are, you know, it, I, I felt like I could go in their homes and open their fridge and know exactly what was in there. And I felt like I was at home. I felt like... So did you learn Hebrew as a kid? I went to... Hebrew, Hebrew school after uh, after school, two times a week. We Were you Tuesday, really, Thursday, or Monday, Wednesday? I was, I don't know, I think it was Tuesday, Thursday. Okay. Been, but it wasn't really that, I mean, I know how to read Hebrew, I don't know what, the, what I'm saying. No. But there's something emotionally satisfying, isn't there? Yeah, there, it's, it really is. You hear those tunes, and you're like, I don't know you from Adam, but we know the same songs. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to feel sort of cleansed and, yes. you know what I mean? I don't know. I felt like, okay, uh, there was something about, um, I was safe, yes. you know? So, and I've always felt that. And I, you know, my mother would sit there, you know, I remember on Yom Kippur, the whole day, I'm like, Ma, can't we, everyone goes home on the break. I am sitting here. I'm like, all right, fine. And when I was six, uh, my mother brought me home to have a peanut butter sandwich on Yom Kippur and I shoved it down my throat, it was at break. We get back, think they're just about to start Mincha. I'm like, Ma, I don't feel well. Judith, you're fine. Ma, I, honestly, I'm like nauseous. Judith, you didn't eat all day. You had a peanut butter sandwich. You're fine. Ma, I sw I'm telling you right now, I am going to get up, puke all over in front of the Bema. I mean, everyone's fasting, and there's like a chewed up peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Is that this was true? Uh, ask my sister. She's coming tonight. 
I go out to the steps to sit, and this is the first time I heard an adult other than my parents curse. And someone came out and said, you know, because the Shabbos Goy was there. Herb, his name was Herb. Herb, it smells like shit in there. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> someone else says shit besides my parents. Wow. Uh, but yeah, there was a okay. thrown up. Passover. You know. Wait, this is my other. Uh oh. This is my big funny joke on Yom Kippur. Remember, I don't know if you remember, when I was about 12, the big thing was this necklace that was an apple core that had been eaten and an Oreo cookie with a bite out of it. And I'm like, oh, I'm wearing that to Yom Kippur. <laughs> Sorry. That's what I wore to Yom Kippur services. <laughs> Everybody loved it, huh? Uh, um, but, all right, Passover. What was Passover like for you? And did you have a large extended family? You know, we didn't. My parents were older. A lot of people were dead. Um, and they lived, for, like, my closest relatives lived in Connecticut. My grandmother always came. My grandmother was there every single weekend. My father's sisters would come. They were annoying. But uh, th this is Passover for two days before Passover. I am never doing this again. <laughs> this is it. No one appreciates a goddamn thing I do. Get out of the kitchen. I'm telling you, this is it. This is the last year. I'm ever, it was like a, you know, it was it's just like a mantra, you know. Did you but learn the four questions? I did the four questions. Anytime I got to perform was great, like oh. my bat mitzvah. That was my first true performance. <laughs> and I was such a nerd. And most kids had a stand on a, I was taller than the rabbi. And I was like, I'm going to. I'm going to kill on this half Torah. And I was like, um, but yeah, I did. I, would I bet you did kill. I did. I did great. Yes. And I did the four. And oh, you know, New Jersey bought mitzvah. So you think, you know, a big deal. Huge party. Of course. No. no. Judah. My, first of all, my brother had, we had brunch at the house after his bar mitzvah. My sister, I, I think they had a, a dessert at the shul after her bat mitzvah. Mine was huge. They had dinner in the shul before and then cake and coffee afterwards. I'm like, Mom, I'm already unpopular, okay? <laughs> Do you realize that on Saturday night you rent a hall and I come out of the cake with sparklers, okay? <laughs> now, Judith, that's how it, mm -hmm. but yeah. Can you do any of the four questions for me now? Manishtana. What do you mitzvah. think? I think you're great. You like that? Yeah, I, I do. do that. Yeah. Fact or fiction? What? The way you mimic your mother. Oh, fact beyond. Okay. And people meet her and go, oh my God, it's exactly, yeah, fact. There are two moments in the play, mm -hmm. the, in your show. One, you talk about how your father called you. Right. On the gay issue. Right. And then he passes away. Right and how you feel you missed an opportunity. Right. True? True. He called, it was nine in the morning. He called me up, and the reason he called me was, my sister was seeing a therapist. She asked me to go with her to the therapist. In that session, I tell my sister I'm gay. My sister is living at home with my parents. My parents are like, I, we can't deal with her. I said, go see a therapist. They go and see the husband of my sister's therapist. My sister's therapist tells her husband, her husband tells my parents in the therapy session. Doesn't tell them, but says, what would you do if one of your children was gay? Or Like, they end up having this discussion. Total breach of contract or ethics. Absolutely. Or, he calls me up, and, and I'm like, no, I, I was, it was your 9 father. in the morning. Your I had father. And asks me. And I'm like, no. Uh, and after he passed away, and my mother, and it was confirmed to but my he mother. he says something to you. He said, Is you know, his father's name? Harold. Harold. He says to you. He says to me, some parents have kids who are gay or bisexual, and they still love them. And I couldn't handle it. You know, I was so young. I was, I mean, I wasn't out to anyone. And so, yeah, so I, you know, I hung up the phone. I, and the, after my mother found out, for sure, first thing out of her mouth, why did you lie to your father? I'm like, Ma, really? So, you know, she, I, I guess they really had talked about it, which I never thought. You say you regret the fact that you right. didn't tell him. True? I do regret it. I think that, mm, yeah. I, I mean, when I find out now, my brother's like, oh, I, you know, they knew before. Uh, yeah, I think it would have made life a little, I don't know, a little. You, once your parents know, I think you can, and I think being out is the most important thing a gay person can do. Because everyone in this country knows and loves a gay person, whether or not they know of it. Of course. And maybe they would change the way they vote, you know. You loved your father. Very much. 
It seemed to me in the play, for all you mimic your mother, you love her too. Oh, I love her more than anything, yeah. And you know, if one didn't know better, I mean, one could imagine that you resented your mother. I think I did as a kid. Um, she was always sticking up for me. She was always the one that, I'm going to get this one, and that one did that to me, and this one did that. You know, it was always, she would all, you know, I'm writing a letter to the president of this company, and I was like, Mom, just shut up. Don't talk to those kids. Like, you know, I, I just, but I did resent it, but it came from love. And also, I, the thing is, even as much as she annoyed me and as much as we fought, I've, I never felt unloved. And you loved her. Oh, I love her so I mean, I talked to her. I'll go to call her right now. I could go on and on and on. We have to close. I want to ask you. Shalom. Yeah. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. The premise of your one-woman show, The Judy Show, right. My Life is a Sitcom, mm -hmm. is that you would love to have your life, as other comedians have had, right. become part of a show. Right. Also true. Right. Okay. And as I said, you're one of the few Jews in your, of your stature, who is comfortable with that being part of who you are right. and you let everybody know. And also you're very comfortable letting the world know you're gay. Right. And you tell the story and you've had some pain in your gay life as well. Oh, and yeah. you've had extraordinary joy with two children as right. well. And now you're with Elise. Elisa. Elisa. Mm -hmm. And she sounds wonderful. She is. And you would love to see a sitcom on that show about your life. I wanna do a sitcom about a real gay family, you know? Like the sitcoms I watched growing up, you know? With my parents, I'd watch them. I'd learn things. I, I learned about abortion from Maud. I learned about the war and racism from All in the Family. I learned about divorce from uh, One Day at a Time. I learned about poverty from Good Times. I learned I could even have a career from Mary Tyler Moore. Back to the Judy Show. Th this is the Judy Show. Well, I think the recipe is there. I think all the elements are there for a successful sitcom. And I mean, the fact that I'm gay should not be the, no, we're not doing that, which is pretty much what it is. And I'm sure the Jew part of it is a problem as well. But uh, to watch a show about a family and say, oh my God, I, oh, we have the same issue. You know, and course. then they forget, oh, that uh, we're just like you. Like when I watched Good Times, I would, you know, it was the same thing. I told you before, I've been looking forward to this. I thank can't you. thank you enough. Oh, thank and you. I really, I wish we had more time. Maybe some other time you'll, you'll let me talk to you more. You're not only an extraordinary performer, you are a very wonderful person. Oh, and you. so thank you for everybody. Thank you for all the things you are. Thank you. And thank you for being so honest with me. I wish you only thank great you. success. And I'll be in the audience all the time, Julie. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Guess what? What? Shalom. Shalom. <laughs> And from the stage of her one-woman show, that was Judy Gold, star of The Judy Show, My Life as a Sitcom. I hope you enjoyed meeting her. By the way, please remember that The Judy Show will be running in Manhattan through October 22nd at Manhattan's DR2 Theater at Union Square on East 15th Street. And if you have the chance to see the show, you'll be doing yourself and anyone you bring with you a big favor, though it's got some rough language and adult themes and may not be suitable for young children. But again, The Judy Show is smart, just plain funny, and at times very sweet and poignant. And like every good piece of art, it helps one get a better look at oneself. For reservations, visit The Judy Show online or call Telecharge at 212-239-6200, or outside New York, call toll-free 800-432-7250. Judy Gold, a very funny comedian and a very special human being. Of course, as always, I invite you to be in touch with me with your own thoughts and reactions to my meeting with Judy Gold. Please write me, email me, post on Shalom TV's Facebook wall, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.
We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD, and we thank you for your kind support. Lachaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media.